I'm Mark Rosengarten. Welcome to... Ask Rosengarten. Hello and welcome to Ask Rosengarten, the show where I, Rosengarten, answer your questions that you ask. To start us off today, we have a question from Jenny Piotrowitz. She says, A 5.325 gram sample of methyl benzoate, a compound used in the manufacture of perfumes, contains 3.758 grams of carbon, 0.316 grams of hydrogen, and 1.251 grams of oxygen. What is the empirical formula of the substance? Now, she says she got the question right, C4H4O, and she said that uh, her problem is why did they give the information 5.325 grams of methyl benzoate? Is that information needed? Okay, that's an excellent question. You see, there's all kinds of information out there, but you don't necessarily always need every piece of information. The way to solve this problem is as follows. For the rest of you who don't know how to solve it, an empirical formula is one where you have the simplest whole number mole ratio of elements in a compound. For example, NaCl. It's a one-to-one -one ratio of sodium to chloride, or CaCO3. One calcium to one carbon to three oxygens. The simplest whole number mole ratio. Now, if you're given grams of these elements, it's very simple to get a mole ratio. All you need to do is divide the grams of each particular element by the weight average atomic mass of each element. For example, 3.758 grams of carbon, divide that by carbon's atomic mass of 12.0 grams per mole. For hydrogen, we take 0.316 grams divided by 1.0 grams per mole, which is hydrogen's gram atomic mass. And then for oxygen, 1.251 grams divided by 16.0 grams per mole, which is oxygen's gram atomic mass. When you do this, grams is going to cancel and leave you with moles of each element. It'll give you a mole ratio. Okay, great. Now we've got a mole ratio, but it's not really a whole number mole ratio. I mean, we, we're not going to really write the formula C.313, H.316, O.0782. We have to turn these into whole numbers. And the best way to do that is to divide all of them by whichever of the mole values is the smallest. That way, the smallest one automatically comes out to 1, because it simplifies, and the others will come out to a whole number. So once we simplify this to whole numbers, it's a 4 to 4 to 1 ratio, or C4H4O. That's the empirical formula of methyl benzoate. There's 4 to 4 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. Okay, now the question is, why did we need the 5.325 grams? Well, you don't need it to answer the question, but it's kind of good form to say, well, we have this sample, and of this 5.325 grams, this is how those 3 point, these 5.325 grams worth of stuff is distributed between the different elements. So this information is not necessary to actually solve the problem, but it's not exactly immaterial. I mean, it's still there. You just don't need to use it to solve the problem. And that happens a lot in this life. I mean, you'd be overloaded with information. You have to ask yourself, which information is useful and which information isn't really going to help me solve this problem. Our next question comes to us courtesy of Joseph Entman. His question is, why does oxygen have only two allotropes? Shouldn't elements like oxygen and sulfur have as many allotropes as they want because they have two bonds and the molecular structure could just be a big circle? It's a good question. Oxygen has two unpaired valence electrons, which means oxygen can form two bonds. Well, sulfur can also form two bonds. 
but sulfur can also do some other crazy things that oxygen can't do. When oxygen bonds with another oxygen, you form a double bond, and that's nice, stable, diatomic oxygen. <gasps> the stuff you breathe in and out. When you hit diatomic oxygen with a little electricity, it breaks this bond and allows another oxygen to come and bond in. This is a fairly unstable molecule. This is called ozone. It's that stuff that way up in the atmosphere prevents ultraviolet rays from getting through and causing us sunburns. But down on the ground level, it's actually a, a respiratory irritant. It's a pollutant, it's air pollution. And it can actually damage the elasticity of your lungs. It's bad stuff to breathe in. Ozone breaks back up into diatomic oxygen at a far greater rate than diatomic oxygen turns into ozone. Because this molecule is fairly unstable, trying to make any other form of oxygen is going to be even more unstable. Personally, I don't know why that is, but I do know that that's the case. Here are your two allotropes of oxygen. You're not going to get a giant molecule of oxygen. You can get S8, right? A uh, eight-sided sulfur, but you're not going to get more than these allotropes of oxygen. And actually, when you look at it, carbon, which has four bonds, that doesn't have a huge number of allotropes either. I mean, you got, you got your coal, and there are a couple of varieties of that. You got your diamond, you got your graphite, and yes, there are buckyballs. There's Buckminster fullerene and the other fullerene sphere molecules, and there's also carbon nanotubes that are out there, but they're all variations on basically the same theme. Now, I did have a couple of other questions, but we're not going to have time to get to them today. Depending on how things shake out over the next couple of days, we may get to them, we may not. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us today for this episode of Ask Rosengarten. If you'd like to ask a question, just email it to askrosengarten at gmail.com. So what are you waiting for? Ask Rosengarten!